So hello, good morning. I am delighted to be here. Um, did you get the reading? You've got my reading material, so you probably noticed that I gave you two education papers to read and wondered about that. Um, so I think it's really important if I know many of you might be sh aiming for careers that have some mix of research and teaching, and I find the teaching side really wonderful, and I hope that these papers will be of use to you, and I also wanted to explain a little bit about my teaching style. So uh, you're going to get to listen to me for uh, 450 minutes this week. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, and so I'm going to take the first five or ten of those to tell you a little bit about teaching. So the first paper that I recommended was, they're both PNAS papers, right? So this is, we all know PNAS, great journal. I think it's the best journal that publishes work on pedagogy, how to teach in science. Like, it's the top. And we, I sent you a Freeman. 2014, which was about active learning. Sorry. And do you know what active learning is? Do you have a sense? So it's basically anything that isn't traditional lecturing almost is active learning. So traditional lecturing is what I'm doing now and actually what I'm mostly going to do and what we're all used to. I lecture at you, you take notes. Occasionally I ask you a question that you can quickly answer by putting up your hand. That's non-active learning. And active learning is where I ask you a question where you need to really think it through. Maybe you discuss with a neighbor. You may have to work out something pencil and paper. You have to manipulate the concepts that I've just taught you and work with them. And this paper was a meta-analysis of 225 studies of active learning. And not surprisingly, they find that when active learning is included in a lecture, the students learn better, they perform better on the examinations for that course, fewer students fail, they perform better not only on the examination for that course, but on sort of standardized um, concept inventory questions, so questions that are not written by that professor, but are designed to test whether students really understand concepts as opposed to just manipulating formulas. Uh, and they retain the information into the next semester and the next year better, all of the above. And what's really interesting, I thought, about Freeman is that he compares um, traditional lecturing versus active learning to like a medical study. In a medical study, you might have a control group that gets the traditional therapy, and then we have a new therapy we want to test. And we give it to the therapy group or the treatment group, and we are going to run this study for a year. But say after three months, we analyze some preliminary data, and we discover, oh, the treatment is really effective. It's helping my patients a lot. Then it becomes unethical to continue the study because you've got all these people in the control group getting the old therapy and you know it's not as good. And so then the study is stopped. It's a common thing in medical literature. It's called stopping for benefit, which is a really weird phrase. So that's what you do when it's unethical anymore to give people the old treatment. And Freeman makes the argument that the evidence for active learning is so overwhelming that it's unethical to do traditional lecturing anymore. But luckily, this is education, it's not medical research, so we just all ignore it and keep going on with our, with our traditional lecturing, myself included. Um, and then the other paper is Delorier. This just came out this fall. And I think it explains a little bit why we all kept doing what we were doing. So did you have a look at um, figure one? In Delorier, if you look at anything, look at figure one in Delorier. I can sketch it. Um, since it's a, a blackboard talk, I'm not, I can't show you, but I can sketch it for you here. So here we have two classes, like two classrooms, same instructor, two topics of the course. One is statics and one is fluids. And for statics, the lecturer does exactly the same lectures to the two classes, but in one of them, every now and then, he just asks sort of normal questions, and in the other one, he does active learning questions every now and then. And then he reverses his strategy for fluids. Then they take the test. In both cases, the test results are sort of like active learning, traditional lecturing. 
So the two classes switched. Whoever got the active learning did better on the test, right? But then, so this was, this is not PNAS level stuff because duh, we have 225 studies already that show us this. But what was made this a PNAS paper was they also, after every lecture, passed out a questionnaire to the students. And the questionnaire said, you know, was this lecturer effective? And did you enjoy the lecture? Uh, did you feel like you learned a lot from this lecture? Do you feel like you understand the material in this lecture very well? And they did the same thing, active. So we'll do like active, traditional, active, traditional. And for all of these questions, the bar chart looks like active, traditional. <laughs> Every single one of them. So the students hate it. They don't feel like they're doing a good job. They, they judge that the lecturer is a less effective lecturer if you do active learning. And they judge that they have not learned as much. And yet, when you give them the test three weeks later, they do much better. So I think this pausing and manipulating stuff, no one likes it. We like to just sit and enjoy a lecture write it down, it all makes perfect sense to us, you just let it wash over you. It's much better, right? Everyone likes that. But so I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna make you stop and do some work and actually do some math and talk to each other, hopefully. So, uh, questions about active learning? Comments? Have you done active learning in your classes, in your other classes? There, yeah, there's like two, oh yeah, there's a little bit, a little bit, okay. Good, good. So, enough about that. Uh, so now to some math, where I'm much more comfortable. <laughs> Although I heard that not all of you are much more comfortable in mathematics. So I didn't realize when I was preparing this that we had some people with lots of biological expertise in the room and less mathematical training. So I think I'm gonna slow things down a little bit from what I planned. And so my lectures, like lecture one, You've got the plan online with my abstracts. It all might like just shift a little bit so that hopefully we keep everybody together. Okay. So this is an intro to probability generating functions. And the math uh, for probability generating functions, there's like almost no calculus involved. There's functions, it's very, you know, relatively simple mathematically. It's not a topic that's usually taught though until something like third year in probability theory because it doesn't come up that much. But it's a really nice thing actually to introduce a kind of mixed crowd of backgrounds to. So I will start with an example. We have an asexual population, they're haploid. at equilibrium, so the population size isn't changing, is what I mean by at equilibrium. And there's a rare de novo mutation. One new mutation happens, so now there's a single copy in the population. And I'm going to introduce a random variable. Who has seen random variables before? Okay, good, good. So, but who has not seen random variables? Don't be shy. Okay. So we have a random variable x. So a random variable just means something that can take many different values. Like if we rolled the dice, then x could be one, two, three, up to six and it's different every time. So x doesn't mean one or two or three necessarily, it can be any of those, depending on what happens. So x is gonna be our random variable for the number of copies of this mutation that make it into the next generation. And I'm gonna tell you what the, how this dice rolling is going to work. So P sub zero is the probability that X equals zero. 
So the probability no copies of this rare allele make it into the next generation will make it really concrete because it's always easier to learn with concrete numbers than symbols the very first time around. P1 is 0. P2 0 0.2. P3 0 0.3. And we could draw this. The probability that we get an I copies, I is 0, 1, 2, 3. More bars. Not very accurate. Okay, something like that. This picture in general, or this distribution, that's called a probability mass function, which I'm going to use later. You think of having a mass of 1 with probability 1, something happens, and we can distribute that 1 between different places. That's why it's the probability mass function. OK, so now I'm going to get you to discuss with your neighbor. Is this a beneficial mutation or a deleterious mutation? OK, and you're like, whoa, how would I know? But you know there's enough information here for you to tell me if it's beneficial or del deleterious. And you can talk, find a neighbor, see what you think. Tell me if you need a hint. I can give you a hint. Good, 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 good. Studies also show that just this act of talking with someone, you retain things so much longer. So if I tell you and you nod and you understand it, you retain it for like an hour. You discuss it with someone else, you'll retain it till at least tomorrow. <laughs> okay. There's my hint. Okay, anyone want to hazard a guess? Yeah? Deleterious? Neutral. Neutral. Okay, why? Yeah, good, excellent. So let me repeat that. So the population's at equilibrium. So how many copies do you expect every gene in the population makes in the, next in the next generation. It should make one, right? Every copy should have exactly one offspring, and that will keep everything <laughs> at equilibrium. And this guy, if we work out the expected value, which was a formula that just got erased, right? But we have, I'm going to use this kind of an E for expectation. The expected value of x we get a 0 with probability 0 0.5. We get a 1 with probability 0. Is what is it? 1 point something? 4? 1 1.4. Yeah? So it's beneficial. Now, let me go back to why did you guys think it was deleterious? Oh, neutral. You thought neutral. Yeah, yeah, sorry. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. Your intuitions are not wrong. Because my next question is, will this, there's, everybody else has this, let's call the whole population, it's a clonal population. So everybody's genetically the same, except for this one tiny, single mutation, which we've decided is beneficial. So will that mutation spread through the population? What do you think? I hear a yes. 
But you neutral guys, what do you think? Unlikely. Unlikely. Yeah. So this is where the people who thought the mutation was neutral, they're kind of focused on this like half the time. It doesn't even make one copy in the very next generation, right? So more than half the time, it's going to go extinct. So although it's beneficial, will it spread? Let's just say not always. And in fact, half the time, it's immediately dead in the water. So the next, I mean, eventually, after we've learned a bunch of mathematical tools, we will figure out how to quantify, how likely is it that this mutation would spread? That's our goal. Yeah. Do they represent any particular process? I find absolutely one and zero off. Yeah, well, no, I, these are just arbitrary. But it actually is interesting because often, uh, if you thought about fission, we'll, of course we wouldn't have this, but you could have it dies before it reproduces, or if it reproduces, it produces two offspring. Right. So, but it could reproduce and then it dies. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, it depends where we're going to put death into the model, right? Yep. By just looking at the expected numbers, can we say that we have the right to the expected Yeah, excellent question. So the question was, just by looking at the expected value, can we tell whether it will spread or not? Well, you can. If the expected value is 1 or less, then you know it won't spread. In mm, it can still spread in a small population. In a very large population, it won't spread. We will get to this. But if it's bigger, you don't know. It depends. So we could have another, I could have written down some different numbers that have the same expected value and would have a completely different probability of spreading. OK, excellent questions. More? OK, on we go. So let's learn some mathematical tools. A few more. So I guess historically, I'll tell you this much now. We would address this question of whether it would spread using a branching process. And a branching process is kind of what it sounds like. You start with a single mutation, say it might spawn a lineage, say it has two offspring, and this guy has two, and this offspring has none, and then this offspring has three. Etc., and we follow it forward in time. And you try to figure out the probability that all of these branches go extinct or that the thing keeps growing sort of infinitely. Um, but to do this, that's just like a tiny taste of what's to come. To do this, we need more probability generating functions. OK, so we'll get this PNAS paper off the board. So a PGF is a way to store and manipulate. a discrete probability mass function. One of these. 
so this is a, like a list of numbers, 0.5, 0, 0.2, 0 0.3. You could think of it a list, a list of ordered pairs. And mathematicians, I mean, I don't really like to manipulate a list of numbers. What do I do with a list of numbers? I don't have a lot of tools in my toolbox for manipulating this list of numbers. So we store these numbers in a function because we love functions. We have all kinds of things we can do with functions. We can bring all of calculus to bear on functions. So really, a PGF is a way to store that picture, a picture like that. And we store them, for the physicists in the audience, we store it as the coefficients of a power series. So it looks like this. I guess I can get it in here. So the PGF f of x, you put p0 by itself, and then you store p1 as the coefficient of x, and you store p2 as the coefficient of x squared. And this is all we need for this particular example, but you could keep going. Okay, and this is really kind of weird at the beginning when you first see it because you want to know what x is. We call x a dummy variable. It's really just a way to store these numbers. Those p's are the important pieces, and we separate them by making them the coefficients of the x's. Or you can think of it as a clothesline. It's a clothesline. Those are my clothes of different lengths there, and I hang them up at different places on this clothesline store them in the function. All right, so that's a probability generating function. And we do it because we love functions. We have so many tools to play with functions. And I will show you that this PGF has some like stunningly beautiful properties, at least to a mathematician, um, beautiful and useful properties. So I hope I will uh, convince you of that. So for our example, so write down the PGF for that probability mass function. Go for it. Pretty easy, yep. Yeah, got it, right? Okay, um, then, okay, I've got like six, seven properties of PGFs, because there's a zero. And the zero with, I'm gonna use it later, but if you, if it's been a while since you did any math, you're not gonna like the zero with property. <laughs> But I'm going to start there anyway because it's where all the textbooks would start when they show you a PGF. But to uh, warm you up, let me add something in here. So this is a quick aside. So this is the PGF for the random variable x that we described before. As an aside, if I ask you for the expected value of x, you know how to do that. We did that already. What if I asked you for the expected value of like little x, which is some number, a dummy variable? Let me add that for your notes. I'm sorry, I keep squeaking the chalk and I don't know what I'm doing. Because this is kind of bizarre notation where you have the random variable and the dummy variable together, we would just take, like you might expect, this expression at all the different values that x can take and do the weighted average. So same kind of thing we would have with probability 0 0.5, this thing is x plus 0. And with probability 0 0.2, this thing is x plus 1. Uh, sorry, x plus 2 and 3. Yeah? No. So here, 
this is how we're storing these coefficients. It's a good question though, but yeah, that's our random variable. It can be zero, two, or three with those probabilities, right? So if I gave you little x is 0.2, we would have 0.2 with this probability, 2.2, and 3.2 with that probability, right? So this is how we combine little x's and big x's. Okay, so having seen that, tell me what is the expectation of x, little x to the big x. Can you write that down? And talk with a friend if you can't just write it down. Yeah, are we good? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Not sure about you, oh, thumbs up, yeah. Okay, so did you get, I guess with probability 0 0.5, x to the zero. <laughs> yeah, and this is gonna go away. And do you recognize that? What is that? It's f of x, right? Yeah, so the, this I put in here because you'll see it in the notes, you'll see it in every single textbook. People will start by saying, they'll define the probability generating function f of x as equal to the expected value of little x to the big x. And like myself and every student I have ever taught are go, what? Like, what does that even mean? I don't know how to combine these two symbols. It doesn't make any sense to me at all why this is true and why are we defining this thing this way, right? But I would prefer, I think of it as the clothesline and then I can derive, it is actually, this is true, but it's certainly not obvious. Okay, so that's property zero. Okay, questions? Can I get thumbs up? I wanna know about the pace here. Are we all good? We still on board? Biologists? <laughs> okay, good. So, property one. Uh, what is F if we evaluate at X equals zero? Um, no, we're going to put in x equals zero, p zero. Huh? All the other terms are going to go away. We're going to be left with p zero. Not just for this probability generating function that I've shown you here, but in general, that's a property, right? Because everything else gets zeroed out. This is an important property. It sounds, seems kind of trivial. I've used this property so many times in my research life. Like daily, I use this property, okay? Okay, property number two. What about f at one? Yeah. <laughs> now we get the sum of all the coefficients. And it's a probability mass distribution. So what's the sum of all the coefficients? It's one, right? Always one. So f of one is always one. And any probability generating function ever, f of one is one and f of zero is p zero. Uh, so now we can actually sketch this guy. Typically, I mean, x can be anything because it's the dummy variable, but typically we think of x as being on zero, one. And so we have one, one. We have zero P zero, which we know is less than one because it's a probability less than or equal to. Okay, uh, physics people, what's the sign of the slope of F? Positive or negative slope? X is a number between zero and one and the coefficients are P, so they're all positive. It's positive, okay, second derivative? Third derivative, 
Exactly, right? So we've got this like increasing and ever more increasing function. So they always are going to slope up like that, faster and faster. It's kind of counterintuitive, actually. Um, I spend almost no time looking at these pictures because all PGFs basically look the same, although somehow encoded in the slopes of that curve, the subtle slopes of that curve, is all the information in the probability mass function, which is kind of cool. Okay, property three. Uh, this is not a property that you will find in the textbooks, but it's one that we're going to use, and it makes the other properties really easy to understand. So it takes me a little while to explain it. The weighted average of two processes is what I'm going to call it. So uh, it's like a game show. I'm going to roll the dice and decide whether we play game A or game B. And then if we play game A, there's a bunch of different outcomes that can happen with different probabilities. But if we play game B, there's a whole bunch of different outcomes that happen with different probabilities. So first we roll the dice and decide A or B, and then we have two different processes that can happen, okay? So process A happens we're going to need that this is with probability, which is a phrase that in a probability course you write out so many thousands of times that we just say with probability. So process A happens with probability, let's call it PA, and process B happens with probability, I'm going to call it PB just because it'll be easier for us to write, but you can tell me what's true of PB. So either A or B happens, so it's one minus, right? Okay, and then if process A happens, then we have a further process that has PGF F sub A of X, and I'm gonna call this P0 plus P1X plus P2X squared, dot, dot, dot. And in, if instead we're playing game B, that's described by the PGF FB. And I'm going to use Qs here. Let's not use Qs because Qs give you the impression that they're one minus the p's, but these aren't. These are completely independent. It's a whole different game, right? So let's say pi zero plus pi one x plus pi two x squared. Okay, what's the outcome? What is the probability that the outcome of this whole game is zero? And here you probably just need some basic, if you've had a first course in probability, you know how to do this. And if you haven't, we can maybe talk you through it. So anyone want to give a guess? There. So P0, you write, here's the probability of zero if we play this game. And pi zero, the probability of zero if we play that game. But first we have to figure out which game we're playing, so there's a little bit more. So first with probability A, beautiful. There's only two games, so yeah, exactly. So first with Probability A, we're playing game A, and then this is the probability we got a zero. Or we could have been playing game B. Got it. Okay, and then what? So that's the zero. The outcome is zero. And outcome is one. P0 
Pa, P1 plus Pb, Pi1, etc. Is that a question or, yeah? Um, so here we're just going to play once. Yep, so I haven't told you anything about a repeated game. So we just do it once. Yeah, yeah I haven't told you enough. Okay, so now with your partner again, write the probability generating function for these outcomes. So for the whole game. the final outcome. So I will call it F, I guess. Are you feeling like you're on the wrong side of figure one right now in the Delorier paper? You're like, oh, this is so boring and stupid. I wish we didn't have to do this active learning crap. <laughs> yeah. So you're going to play once, but you don't know if it's going to be A or B. No, you don't know. Don't, don't, there, there is no second time. Just one time, tell me what's the probability that you get a zero at the end of one time, yeah? Yeah. So are you able to, have you got this term, this is your coefficient of getting zero, right? And then this is your coefficient of getting one and analogous terms, you got all that? Can we get thumbs up from especially biology majors? <laughs> yeah, ish, okay. And then we can rearrange that, right? I'm not gonna write that all out because I think that's just a lot of board work. Yeah, well, all the coefficients, but they're multiplied. So this would be the coefficient of x. Yep. Okay, so now factor out your PA terms. And factor out your PA terms. So this equals PA times what? Plus PB times what? So you should be getting something like P A P zero plus P one. Yeah? Okay, and can you simplify this for me? Yeah, excellent, excellent. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go past the line here because then we can complete this idea. So f of x is pa times fa of x plus pb times fb of x. So when you have these two processes and one of them happens with one probability and one with another, you can do the same kind of weighted average for the probability generating function, the two probability generating functions. Yeah. It's a nice, simple little result, which we'll need later. Yeah. Yeah, you missed because you were chatting with your neighbor there <laughs> when I said, I'm just going to use this one piece because it completes the thought. <laughs> but I won't use it again because I got in trouble. <laughs> All right, so that was prob 
That was three. On to four. So with property four, we get start to get into some really cool stuff. Yeah. So does this hold for uh, probably just sensory functions as well, or is there any sort of problem with that? Yeah, excellent question. The question was, does this hold for probability density functions, which would be on a continuous variable? And the answer is no. Not probability generating functions, but there are other generating functions that work for continuous variables. But you can see you, cut, you run into a problem here because you don't have these discrete numbers, yeah. So you don't even know how to begin to write it down. So yeah, it's just not the right formalism. Okay. So the sum of independent events is for Okay, so I'm going to build another whole story for you to listen to first. So we're going to have a generation, generation number one. But I'm going to start with two copies. Who cares how? It's not really biologically motivated, this example. So we're going to start with two copies of this mutation. So let's say generation one has... two individuals. Okay, and then we will let y1 be the random variable for the number of offspring or copies of the gene, whatever you like, uh, produced by individual one. and y2. Okay, so two guys, they're each producing offspring. And let's say that they are, they're twins. Oh, that's how we explain it, they're twins. <laughs> and so they, uh, they both have the same probability mass function for their offspring, exactly the same. So, that was terrible. So it's the same probability mass function and we're going to describe it with a PGF G of X. Okay, and they're independent. The, for people that have some probability, these are independent, identical, and what IID, help me out here. Independent, <laughs> independent identical distributions, yeah. Okay, so IID. Don't worry about that if you don't know what it is. So they both independently roll the dice according to the numbers that are stored in G of X and figure out how many offspring they're going to have. So my question is, what's the PGF for the total number of kids So that would be Y1 plus Y2. Okay, and this here, the proof is a little non-obvious, but extremely cool. So, by, we're going to use property one, or property zero. Weird property. So the PGF for something y1 plus y2, you're flipping back to property zero. That was that weird expected value one. Expected value of little x to the big x, but in this case our big x is y1 plus y2. Yeah, so if you were with me on prop property zero, this is pretty clear. And now we can do some like pretty simple math here. 
expectation of x to the y1 times x to the y2. And I said that they were independent. So because they're independent, the product of the expectation and the expectation of the product are the same thing. Independent and therefore this equals expectation x to the y1, expectation x to the y2. And what is this? Yeah, excellent. There's g of x, again by property zero. And here's another g of x, yeah? g of x, g of x, we can write it as g of x all squared. Um, which we're going to use this kind of notation. Yeah. And I haven't proven this. I mean, I've just proven it for two. But if we started out with five individuals, you can kind of see that all of this would still hold and we'd have g to the fifth, et cetera. So if you have n independent individuals having offspring, the sum of all the offspring is, well, the PGF describing the sum of the offspring is the PGF of each of them raised to that power. All right, so let me get that down for your notes. Independent, identically distributed, random variables. Each with PGF f of x has PGF f to the nth power of x. So that is property four. Okay, we're going to use that as well. <laughs> All of these, we just keep building, building, building. We're going to use them all. OK. Uh, we only have to do five and six. Still good? OK, so property five, composition. So new story. Generation zero, one individual. Okay. And then that one individual has offspring, their offspring distribution is f. Is it f? It's f. And then each of those offspring have offspring. But times have changed, and now the kids have a different offspring distribution. It's g. OK, so we have generation 0, one individual offspring according to f of x. But each of these guys. have offspring according to g of x, something like that. So I'm going to need a little bit more notation. Uh, so this random variable, how many children there are, we're going to use x for that. in generation one. And we'll let yi be the random variable for how many children. I guess in this case, we could call them grandchildren, right? Uh, individual i contributes. 
to generation two. So this, this guy is y1, y2, y3, and this number right here is x. Okay, you can see where this is going. I want you to tell me the PGF for the total number of grandkids. It's tricky. Yeah, so I'm going to let y is it's the random variable for total number of grandchildren. So this whole number, the sum of the yi, is big Y. Y equals Y1 plus Y2 plus, and how many Y's do we have? Yeah, exactly. We've got X. But we don't know what x is. So we're summing up this number, but we don't know how many terms. The number of terms itself is a random variable. It's super cool. Uh, but property three, which happens to be right here, uh, is going to come to our rescue. OK, so we can think of it this way. If x equals 0, what's y? 0, excellent. If x equals 1, so oh, actually, let's do one more column, y equals 0, and the PGF for y. What's the PGF for 0 offspring all the time? The probability of x being 0 is equal to what number? 1. 1. So p0 is 1. So that's the PGF. Yeah? Kind of crazy. This is the PGF for if you never have any offspring. OK. If x equals 1, what's the PGF for y? We don't know really what y will be. But we do know it's PGF. We had one guy here, and then we have these offspring. That's the end of the story. Those guys are distributed with G. So it's G. G gives you the total number of grandkids in this case. OK, you can see where I'm going next. x equals 2. I had two kids. In fact, I do have two kids. What's the PGF describing my grandkids? Now we need property 4. Now we've got two individuals. They're each having offspring Described by g of x? G squared. g squared, excellent, excellent. Yeah, now you see the pattern, right? Yeah, so now I've got if x equals 0, I need this probability generating function. If x is 1, I need this probability generating function. If x is 2, I need this one. What's the probability x equals 0? We could get that if we knew f, right? So let me write a couple more lines here. I've, I've migrated all the erasers. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, so I'm going to use property three now. This is the weighted average when game A and game B. Remember game A and game B? Game A and game B, we have PGF for the grandkids is probability x equals 0 times 1 plus the probability x equals 1 g of x probability x equals 2 times g of x squared okay so this is like the money slide. This is the coolest part of the talk. I'd kind of like you to discover it. There's a really easy way to write this. So recall, let me just give you a little hint. F of x, by definition, number of kids, probability x equals 0, probability x equals 1 times x. Probability x equals 2 times x squared. All right, that's our definition of f of x. This is what we want. Can you write this for me in terms of that? Yeah. Excellent. f of g of x, right? Isn't that beautiful? So we get f of x, or no, we get probability of a PGF for Y equals F of G of X. Okay, so this applies whenever you have generations one after another and the probability generating functions could be the same or different. So if these were the same, if F was equal to G, we could have g of g of x, for example, right? So when, when one generation gives birth to the next generation gives birth to the next generation, you can use functional composition to move ahead a generation and always count the total number of individuals in the lineage. This is like a super, super powerful property of PGFs. Yeah. It will, exactly. So the question was, if you had to constrain the population size at some point to be n, you're going to have problems. Because not everybody, eventually g of x isn't going to hold anymore. You're going to start to have fewer offspring. So you can't go to infinity with this. You can't go to realistic population sizes often. And we're going to talk about that later on. That's yeah, a really good question. OK, so let me put something on the board about property this five. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of what I just said, but so you can process for a few more minutes. If one generation has PGF f of x, and each of those individuals, this is very um, hand wavy. We could write it out more formally, but it would be a lot more words. So I hope you'll bear with me. But each of those individuals have offspring described by g of x, total number of offspring in the lineage, lineage equals f of g of x. Also notice the ordering because it's a little counterintuitive. In fact, the more mathematical you are, the more counterintuitive this is. Because f happens first and then g. 
And mathematically, when you see this, you think G happens first and then F, right? But the way that the math works out, they go in this order, kind of left to right in the composition. Okay, last property, and then I'm gonna make you play, make you play a little bit. Um, Notice how I've got more and more luxury as time goes on. Now I'm just like telling you stuff. But we're going to pause for some active learning in a moment. OK, six expected value of the, I'm going to say original, just to make it clear, original random variable. So this is not to be confused with property zero, which is how we can write any probability generating function in terms of an expected value. This is way back at the very beginning. Is this beneficial or deleterious? And we worked out the expected value for the random variable itself before we even worked, you know, knew what a probability generating function is. We're going to go back to that. So if you want to know the expected value of the a random variable, uh, you would want expectation of x, p0 times 0 plus p1 times 1 plus p2 times 2, etc. And we have, if I gave you a probability generating function, Uh, okay, physicists, I would like, let me put one more term in here. P3x cubed. I'd like to do something to this function so I could get this 2 down here and this 3 down here. What am I going to do? Yeah, take the derivative. So if I consider f prime of x. It would be p1 plus 2p2x plus 3p3x squared. OK, so I'm getting closer. And I want to do one more thing to turn this into this. Any ideas? Yeah, brilliant. Let's just evaluate at x equals 1. So f prime of, x, f prime of 1 will give us p1 plus 2p2 plus 3p3. Yeah. So if I hand you a probability generating function, um, in many cases in my research, I will have, I'll know something about the probability generating function, or I'll have some like complicated expression for it mathematically, but I won't have I won't have it so simply, like I don't know the p0, the p1, the p2, I just know the whole thing looks like this. And then if I wanted the expected value, I can take the derivative and evaluate at 1. It's often very useful. So uh, I guess we want to put f prime of 1 gives the expected value of the random variable. And I'm going to also show you a picture again. Remember this p0. 1, 1. OK, here are two different probability generating functions. Which one has the higher expected value? This guy, right? Oh, colored chalk. Sorry. Higher expectation from that guy, because the slopes, we look at the slope at 1. It also kind of makes sense, because to get the slope at 1 there, you see what I did without even really thinking about it. Um, actually, no, I'm lying. <laughs> P0 is higher in this case. 
but the expected value still is bigger in this example. If I did one like this, we would have an even higher expected value. Okay. Yeah, no, you can, if any arbitrary mass function, you can write its probability generating function. I mean, it might be a series that goes on forever, right? They generally are. We'll do some examples and you'll see, I think. Okay, I'm going to make you do some more work now. Um, where is my games to play? Here we go. Pause for active learning, it says right here in my notes. <laughs> so I just want you to, I guess it's sort of, you can think of this as being like partly tutorial. I'm now gonna give you a bunch of questions which you can work on a little bit uh, just to make sure that you're kind of getting it. So uh, suppose I have this probability mass function. I have zero with probability 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.2.1. Uh, this is in generation one. Yeah, that's all. I'm all good, okay. So you should be able to, at this point, write f of x. Should be pretty easy. Um, compute f of zero and tell me what it means. What's f of one and why? Tell me what f of f of x is. I mean, describe to a friend the physical process that this just is talking about, right? And if you can do that, then also what's f of f of zero? And true or false question? Does f of f of one equal probability of zero offspring in generation two? Probability of one offspring, sorry. And f of f of x, what about f squared of x. Because they're very different. And let's do one more. Meaning of d by dx f squared of x evaluated at x equals one. Sorry about the tiny writing. Okay, so I'll give you an option here. Um, I can spread this lecture out and continue on in my next lecture and leave these with you. Or we can do these now and then put some of, you know, we'll just use up whatever time we have. I guess my question is, do you want to do these now and get the answers for them or do you want to take them away? We will do a straw vote. So I would prefer to take these away and do them in the comfort of my own dorm room. Hands up, 
And I would prefer to do them now and see the answers discussed. Okay, I guess the dorm room wins <laughs> for today, but I might not give you the choice next time. All right, so if you have questions about these, feel free to ask me. And, and if we get, if I hear a lot of questions, we'll, we'll just talk about them next time I'm up here. Okay. All right, so we're gonna move on a little bit. Uh, then we get to go to extinction probabilities. So we're starting to get towards sort of the promised goals of this lecture. Okay. This part makes me very happy because I love extinction probabilities. <laughs> I mean, I hate it when things go extinct, obviously, but um, having said that PGFs have all these incredible properties, this is the most mind-blowingly beautiful of them all, and you get to see them, and I love teaching this part. So, extinction probabilities. We have PGF f of x describes the offspring distribution for everybody in this lineage. Okay, so we start with one individual. in the lineage, and a branching process ensues. We have one guy, they have offspring, described by F, they have offspring, described by F, etc. Of course, it can't go on forever, as you pointed out, because eventually this lineage is going to get so big that it's going to start using up too much space, resources, niche space, whatever, and things will change. But for the first few generations, we'll assume that f of x holds. Okay. So, uh, what's the PGF describing the number of children? F, excellent. The number of grandchildren described by what? Yes, so f squared of x, f of, no, sorry, I told you the wrong thing, f of f of x, yeah, f of f of x, and then f of f of f of x, right? Yeah, so let's get that on the board. Number of kids described by f of x, number of grandkids, f of f of x. And generation, let's call it one, two, three, F of F of F. Okay, so after a long time, N generations, assuming we have lots of space for this lineage to expand in, we would have F. where this composition is going to happen n times. Uh, we often mathematically would write that with n in a little bracket like this. So this is not, this is different, right? This is n compositions, not n powers. Okay, so can you tell me what is the probability, actually let's start back here. What's the probability that there are zero kids? P0, which we could get by F of zero, right? 
f of zero would give us probability no kids. Probability of no grandkids? Yeah, f of f of zero, which would be f of p zero, exactly, but let's just call it f of f of zero. So any PGF in the world, no matter how complicated it is, if you put in x equals zero, you get the probability of zero. So probability of zero individuals in this lineage in generation three, f of f of f of zero. Yeah. Okay, so very, very far in the future after n generations, what's the probability that the lineage has gone extinct? Just put a zero here, right? So I'm gonna call that big X, super big X, not a random variable. Probability of extinction of the lineage. Um, and mathematicians, we would prefer to write it like this. N goes to infinity, F to the N evaluated at zero. But I actually think it's nicer to see it for the first time to remind yourself that this is really f of f of f. All these functional compositions with an infinite number of them, in fact, and then evaluated at zero. So to figure out if the lineage is going to go extinct, if I handed you f, you would compose it and compose it and compose it and compose it. And after you've done an infinite number of compositions, you plug in x equals zero. Okay, very messy. But then there's this gorgeous, gorgeous property. Are you ready? I'm so excited. <laughs> okay, so take f of both sides of this equation. So if this is equal to this, then f of this has to equal f of that, right? So f of x equals f of f of f of zero. Okay, so now we have infinity plus one. On this side, still infinity, right? So this is equal to this. That's an equal sign. So this equals this equals this equals this. So beautiful, yeah, so we get. You all see it coming, I can hear you. We get f of the extinction probability. Actually, I'm gonna write it the other way around. It's just like slightly easier to understand. What's the extinction probability? Okay, what do you call that? for a function, it's like a fixed point, intersection. So on our sketch, if this is x and this is f of x, this is the line y equals x. Here's one, one. There's my f of x. To find the extinction probability, we have to find the point where f of x equals x. It's that point right there. And what's so cool about this result is that you wanna find the extinction probability after an infinite number of generations and in principle, you'd have to do an infinite number of compositions and then evaluate at zero, which would be really super awful to do. And instead, you just look at one generation. This is just f of x of the very first generation, right? You look at one generation, you find the fixed point, and that's it, that's the answer. Okay, it's a property that I have like written many papers, I couldn't have written papers without use this property all the time. So elegant. Um, there's one little caveat about this. Uh, 
Uh, we won't go into exactly why, but some of you may be wondering about this point. Because f of x equals x here, and in fact, f of 1 will always equal 1 for any probability generating function, right? So sometimes there are two solutions to this equation. And without going into all the details, we could prove that when there are two, the smaller one is always the extinction probability. And then when there's one, the extinction probability is one. So technically, extinction probability is given by the smallest solution to f of x equals x and f of 1 equals 1 is always a solution. Yeah, Chris. Yeah. No, it can go like, I'll show you an example. It's an excellent question. That's a straight line. <laughs> they can go like this. Yeah, it can be shallow. And in fact, they can sometimes, I mean, they don't even have to look that shallow, but they can be like this kind of thing. Um, also, it's an excellent question because uh, if you remember the slope, the expected value, is given by the slope at this point, and everybody goes through this point. If your slope is exactly one or less than one, there's only one root to this equation, only one solution. Extinction is guaranteed, right? And as soon as your slope is greater than one, like we already found, then you have to get back across because you have to get to P0. So you start down here, but you've got to get across. So there has to be one other solution, and then your extinction probability is non-zero. Yeah? So, would it be true for this to say that uh, if that's x, the slope of f of x is greater than 1, then the extinction is zero? Um, if the slope is greater than 1, then the expected value is greater than 1. So I would say once that lineage got established, it would grow exponentially. I mean, geometrically, actually, but yep. Um, but it may not get established, like we saw in the very first example. 50% of the time, it just is dead. Yeah. But once it's big enough, yes. Yeah. OK, more questions? Yeah. So after n generation, Uh, it, uh, is, is the probability like by the nth generation? So we took the limit as n goes to infinity. This proof only works because I said we did an infinite number and then an infinite number equals an infinite number plus one. If you wanted to know the probability of extinction in 10 generations, you couldn't do this anymore. But you could do extinction equals 10 compositions at zero. But you can't use this part anymore. So this mark of Zorro would not hold if you cared about 10 generations. OK, apparently that's the end. <laughs> More questions? Yeah. I'm not sure if it's your question, but John is wondering, um, could it be that we can buy two generations with John was going to indicate that you were still alive by generation 9, and it's in the 10th generation that you gain the last two generations? Yeah, if we did that. We're going to talk more hopefully if we get to it, about if we care about when extinction happens, what do we do? This, this is all just really, yeah, and this is all really, it has happened by infinity. Okay. You know, I, with permission of Kavita, I will add one more thing because it just follows really nicely here. Um, and we were talking about this slope. If this, what if the slope's exactly one? 
which would mean the expected number of offspring is exactly one. It doesn't mean everyone always has one offspring. If the expected number of offspring is exactly one, do you have a sense of whether what the extinction probability is? So we would have to draw it. The slope's one here. Right at that very last point, it's one. But it's got to get over to this axis. And everything, the slope has to be always positive. All the derivatives are positive. So it's got to kind of just go right over. So it can't have another intersection point. So, uh, and this, you now, some reviewers of a paper of mine very recently just told me this was wrong, and it's true. If the expected value of the offspring distribution is one, that lineage will eventually go extinct. Hmm? Oh, if P's, oh, that's a very good point. Yes, we could have this. Yeah, that's a really good point. There's one exception. Well done. So if everyone has exactly one offspring all the time, with probability one, I have one offspring. F of x equals x. This is that very degenerate case, right? Then the lineage doesn't go extinct. Yeah, yeah. So this is all, um, it is related. This, as I will discuss next lecture, this assumption that you were talking about as well over here, that everybody has the same offspring distribution forever, assumes we have this very large, infinitely large, in fact, population size, so nobody interacts with anybody. And then we, uh, in that case, neutral mutations would never fix. But then we have to relax that assumption and do some harder math to do a finite population size. Okay, you guys are a wonderful class. I get so many good questions and feedback and nods, so thank you. And I guess we get some tea now.